We are live and recording. Uh, I'm just waiting for the others. I uh, uh, haven't seen uh, Kunusan up here yet. Uh, Governor uh, Emil, are you there? I think we'll just give them a minute uh, or two. Sure. Yeah. Okay, alarm's going off. Governor will be joined. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. Is uh, Parker Mill uh, coming? Yes. Good morning, uh, Kunusan. Yes, hi, how are you? Very well, nice to see you, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Haven't seen you since we last met in Vietnam. <laughs> Long time. Indeed. <laughs> um, yep. Yeah. So where are you? Uh, I'm good. I'm, in, uh, I'm fine in Singapore. And, uh, oh, okay. Uh, we are doing slightly better than the rest of the... I mean, we're trying to live with the virus. So, uh, you know, a, a mask is never too far away from, uh, you know, <laughs> from us. How are you keeping, sir? Well, situation in Japan is getting better. So we are quite happy. Right. Okay. Pakamila, is that you? Yes. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, it's morning in Surabaya, East Java. <laughs> it's morning in Singapore as well. I think uh, we should go ahead. Um, uh, I'm sure uh, uh, you know Mr. Joseph Chan will uh, join us in a bit. Mm. Uh, so let me begin by uh, you know welcoming you from uh, Singapore. Uh, a very good morning, uh, and welcome to this uh, plenary session of the uh, Horasis Asia Forum. Uh, my name is uh, Ravi Velour, and I'm an associate editor and uh, Asia columnist for the Straits Times. Uh, I thank uh, Horasis and Frank, uh, Frank Jurgen Richter, for inviting me to moderate this panel, and it is my uh, absolute delight and pleasure to welcome uh, four distinguished speakers. Uh, Joseph Chan, uh, Undersecretary for Financial Affairs and Treasury in the Hong Kong uh, Administration. Uh, Mr. Taro Kono, uh, Member of Parliament, leading figure of the LDP party and, uh, you know, a very public figure in Asia in these uh, last, uh, uh, you know, more than a decade. Uh, we know him very well, not only for his public roles, but also from the time he was in the private sector and posted in Singapore. Uh, and, uh, you know, a pre-sinner of the UN Capital Development Fund based in New York. And uh, we're also joined this morning by the Vice Governor of East Java Pro Province, uh, Emil Dardak. Uh, welcome, everybody. Now, this meeting is taking place at a time, uh, a very vital time in East Asia, uh, with uh, uh, thanks to Japan, the CPTPP already being in place. Uh, and uh, again, thanks to Japan and other countries, the RCEP is soon to get off the ground. Now, these are positives for the region and the world. But at the same time, there is much that goes the other way. Uh, you know, China's dual circulation, uh, India's self-reliance themes, 
Uh, all this suggests that there could be an element of pushback or attempts to find new formulations. And even in ASEAN now, we are seeing some moderation of ambitions for an integrated production base. So, and many of us are, uh, are also watching the attempts by the U.S. and China towards some sort of uh, technological decoupling. And uh, we wonder where things are going to end up. Now, this session is for uh, 45 minutes, and I'm keen that the panelists have the maximum say. Uh, I suggest that uh, each of you take about uh, maybe three or four minutes to make your opening statements, uh, and we can then take it from there. Uh, I'm going to invite you to speak in the order of speakers uh, that I was given by Frank, and I would start uh, with uh, Mr. Joseph Khan. Uh, Under Secretary for Financial Service and the Treasury in the uh, Hong Kong administration. Uh, Joseph, uh, you know, like Singapore, Hong Kong is a trade driven economy uh, and you need the world to make a living. Uh, against that background, could you give us your thoughts, please? The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here today to share with you our thoughts on, on this um, very important subject. Well, to begin with, let me share with you. Uh, how Hong Kong has been dealing with the um, uh, the COVID situation uh, recently? Well, mm -hmm. actually, over the last um, three three months or so, we only we we have only recorded one uh, local case. So, by and large, uh, the epidemic is uh, quite under control here. Well, if you look at our measures, it's a combination, right? On one hand, um, we have uh, vaccination just uh, reached seventy percent for the first jet. Uh, also, we have uh, applied what we call a leave home safe application so that um, uh, residents would actually um, record uh, where they have been um, such uh, in public places such as restaurants or, um, or, um, or gym rooms or so, so that in case there is an infected case, it's easier for us to trace the close contact there. And also, we, of course, uh, we have the uh, quarantine requirement as a risk-based uh, system where for those uh, come from high-risk uh, locations or countries, then they will be required up to uh, 21 days of quarantine. For those uh, coming from low-risk uh, places, then uh, would be uh, shorter, uh, such as uh, seven days. And on top of this, in case if we find an individual case, then we will put the close contacts under quarantine. So close contact are defined as those people, let's say, who live with uh, the infected person. And we will also condone off the building where the confirmed uh, case live in and require the residents to go through testing, so on and so forth. Um, so far, the strategy works quite well. Even for that one uh, single local case we identified over the last few months, um, we believe that is actually that person actually infected uh, from baggage he handled from the airport. And after all, we did not see the spread in the local community afterwards. So actually, if you look at the... Um, Normalcy Index by economists conducted a few months ago. Among the 50 countries or economies uh, uh, covered by that index, uh, including France, Germany, New Zealand, or so, uh, Hong Kong ranked number one globally in that. So by and large, our economic activities have uh, resumed normal. In fact, for the first three quarters um, this year, our GDP growth uh, recorded 7% on the year-on-year -year basis. This year or the full year, we have projected that from 4% to the growth. Our unemployment rate currently stands at 4.5%. Uh, uh, actually, we found from the of 7.3% to the year. As part of our controlling the economic uh, growth, uh, we also have a scheme, a consumption voucher scheme pushed forward in the second half of this year to help stimulate the economy. <coughs> Uh, the, actually, a, any eligible resident locally will receive a 650 US dollars of uh, electronic consumption voucher. So um, all these, I think, contribute to a strong local consumption and the resumption of our, our, our local e uh, economic activities. Actually, based on the normalcy index I mentioned just now, the economists assess Hong Kong that we are back to 96% of our activities at the pre pandemic level. So um, that's where we stand. And I hope uh, the measures that I shared with you so far could be made reference for other um, Asian countries. Well, talking about um, helping Asia in general, especially the developing economies, one very important platform we believe is, is to use multilateral platform. That's why Hong Kong has been a keen supporter 
for multilateral agencies, including the Asian Development Bank, ADB, and also the Asia, Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, AIIB. Um, so, for example, uh, well, ADB, they support the, um, <coughs> they support the uh, local uh, uh, Asian members, right, to have a resilience and uh, inclusive economics development uh, and to eradicate uh, the extreme poverty. Well, over the years, Hong Kong has actually contributed around 1 billion US dollars in the form of capital subscription and also direct contribution to the Asian Development Fund. So um, all these are actually uh, supporting projects to uh, aim at poverty <coughs> uh, reduction and also improving the quality of life. If we look at um, AIIB, right, um, also all together, um, we, have con we have committed 766 million US dollars um, at the same time, we contributed extra 10 million US dollars for the AIIB project uh, preparation special fund. So that not only we sponsor the projects approved, but also for certain projects when they want to do the preparation application, we provide certain technical assistance and support. On top of that, I would also like to highlight that some of the money in that special fund uh, during the pandemic, uh, it goes to allocate vaccine financing for the low and middle income members as well, which is very important during COVID, sure. as, we, uh, as we all know, the uh, lower income countries uh, require uh, right. more support on that. The last point I would like to highlight is that it's not only about um, uh, monetary support. Um, in Hong Kong, we also support uh, the multilateral agencies through knowledge exchange, where uh, through our different forum and seminars, we share with other Asian countries or members about how we use technology to uh, combat uh, the epidemic and also how we use fintech to improve financial inclusion um, as well. Um, and also Hong Kong as uh, Asian <coughs> leading international financial center uh, have been used in multiple o uh, occasions for right. bond issuance, including uh, over 1.2 billion US dollars worth of bonds issues by <coughs> ADP last year. Sure, so sure. I'll, I'll stop here and later I'll share more uh, during the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph, because I think uh, just the return of normalcy in Hong Kong itself would contribute a lot uh, to uh, the Asian flows. Well, we'll come back to a few more points that we need to discuss uh, about broad uh, regionalization, globalization. And uh, you are a key player in it and now complicated by geopolitics and uh, political issues. Uh, um, I'm going to ask uh, Pak Emil to come on next, uh, but he'll have to unmute. Uh, and uh, sure. uh, Pak, uh, could I ask you... Um, you uh, you are a R.I. boy, you know, uh, for the rest <laughs> you, R.I. boy means a Raffles Institution boy. And uh, 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 we're aware that Parker Mail studied here in Singapore and, uh, you know, which is probably one of the most globalized uh, countries in Asia. And now you run East Java, which is, uh, you know, a bit different in the development curve from uh, Singapore. Now, Buck, uh, how do you view globalization from the point of, from the viewpoint of the people that you govern? Yeah, very interesting. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Ravi. So, yeah, as an RI boy, I had the opportunity to meet up with, with uh, friends who are now actually occupying some really uh, important posts in the Singapore government or private sector. Uh, but East Java has 40 million population. We are the second largest province in Indonesia, and we are the second largest economy in terms of regional GDP in Indonesia. Uh, a, a very rough estimate shows that our GDP would be two-thirds of that of Vietnam. And, uh, and we have 38 municipalities, which means we have the likes of Surabaya, which you may be aware is the second largest metropolis in Indonesia. But we also have a number of municipalities which are still struggling with some basic uh, infrastructure and also lack of access to education. So it's really two different worlds. Uh, uh, we contribute the largest number of uh, uh, successful state university applicants in Indonesia. Uh, we also uh, become the uh, grand champion for many science competition or student competition in Indonesia, but also uh at the same time we are still facing some really elementary issues when it comes to human basic needs but uh overall what i'd like to say is the viewpoint about globalization 
uh, with the uh, the penetration of uh, digital technology is unbelievable. Uh, about nearly 30% of the high school graduates would continue to university or higher education, and the remainder 70% uh, more or less would would uh, directly go into uh, working f- after filling, f- uh, finishing their 12 years of education. But we did a survey uh, last year uh, in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, so somewhere in the second half of 2021, uh, my, my apologies, 2020, and we found that among the 70% of those who decide not to continue to university, so they would actually be classified as the low to middle, middle low income uh, families, uh, the more nearly half of them have uh, started adopting e-commerce. Uh, they have actually purchased goods from the internet uh, or from e-commerce marketplace. And uh, the, the most favorite uh, forms of payment is not cash on delivery, is actually bank transfer followed by e-wallet. So it's amazing how the uh, digitization really penetrate to the to the uh, to the society in Indonesia, uh, the use of smartphone is is no longer just the confined to the uh, upper level, but of course it doesn't directly correlate. You know, when when it when we talk about digitization, it doesn't mean that they start consuming um, uh, foreign uh, media or foreign uh, entertainment content. Uh, not not necessarily. So I cannot uh, automatically. Assume that uh, you know the the level of penetration of uh, digital lifestyle uh, correlates with the awareness on global issues, and um, because a lot of the content being consumed are actually local content, and there is this what we call as hyper local, where we have micro influencers with probably a thousand to ten thousand followers in the social media, but they have really high engagement with their followers. So uh, hyperlocal is emerging, and as a result, uh, even uh, interaction within a municipality or a rural neighborhood takes place in the digital space. Uh, so, um, uh, yeah, the room for possibly globalizing is there, given the penetration of digital um, uh, technology and ownership of smartphones and access to internet. About 67% of the villages out of nearly 8,000 villages in East Java already has access to broadband technology. And out of the 8,000, the only 660 has very poor access to internet. Uh, the remainder, which doesn't have fiber optic, relies on mobile internet. But if we talk about Surabaya, and Malang, the two of the, the two largest uh, cities in East Java, uh, they all have more than uh, one to two million population. Uh, they're they're really uh, affluent. Uh, the level of university graduates, the occupation that they pursue, they're working in financial sector, they're working in services. So it's really an affluent society, uh, which I I, I presume <coughs> then. Uh, they're very uh, adaptive to what's happening. You talk about CPTPP as well. And of course, Indonesia is one of a, a very uh, uh, serious proponent for this uh, regional partnership. Uh, we have shown a very encouraging investment figure in the past quarter. Uh, we Our investment actually increased by uh, 15%, 15%. It's larger than the national growth. And also, uh, Surabaya is one of the hub for export and import. Uh, the only constraint we have right now is what everyone is facing, which is the container shortage. But uh, we are one of a global uh, hub for for uh, uh, manufacturing in, in, uh, in Asia. And uh, we are very uh, positive in terms of how Surabaya is really trying to be at least the hub for uh, global investors if they want to penetrate the ASEAN market. So we're building we're building a serious uh, infrastructure uh, uh, to really be on top of the uh, existing available infrastructure that is already uh, considered adequate to to uh, welcome foreign investors. But we're building more in, in, in with the hope of being a uh, regional manufacturing base for Southeast Asia. Thank you. Thank you for those uh, comments, because, you know, it's so interesting uh, that at one level you're so plugged into the world, but then the hyper-local is uh, taking off in a big way, uh, thanks to saying there are some issues in, in what you said that we'll come back to, uh, including uh, digital trade within ASEAN and whether RCEP 
adequately addresses that. But uh, let me turn to uh, Kunusan. Um, uh, uh, you know, Kunusan, you were, it's so many responsible, uh, I mean, responsibilities in the cabinet uh, over these past years. And uh, you were in the room when the big decisions were taken by Prime Minister Abe, Prime Minister Suga. Uh, and, um, you know, you had a big role in fashioning the CPTPP after the Americans pulled out. Um, you know, these are, these are momentous steps for the region. Perhaps you might like to uh, uh, give us your thoughts on where we stand today in this whole issue of uh, regeneration of uh, globalization or regionalization within Asia. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for inviting me over to this uh, uh, forum. Well, we, Japan, have signed uh, RCEP and uh, TPP, or CPTPP. Well, as RCEP is a large free trade agreement that created the free trade regime in Asia or Pacific, uh, it is a free trade thing, whereas TPP is, well, it created the free trade regime in Indo-Pacific, but it is not just a, a rule making in trade. Uh, by creating TPP, we originally thought to have a new regime which would replace age-old uh, hub-and-spoke system uh, with United States sitting in the center. Well, the, right after the World War II, the United States economy was so strong, it could hold a hub-and-spoke system over the Pacific. But uh, as everyone else catching up, uh, U.S. Econ economic dominance is waning, uh, we need to replace hub and spoke system with a new regional system. So originally, the President Obama convinced the Prime Minister Abe, TPP is a new upcoming regional system, and it set rules not just for trade, but uh, investment or labor or intellectual property right or, you know, digital everything. So we paid a high political cost to join TPP, but as we are signing TPP, the United States left, and uh, it beat the original intention. It was quite unfortunate. So we are still hoping uh, for the U.S. to come back to TPP regime. I even proposed to change Trans-Pacific Partnership to Trump-Pence partnership uh, to get the U.S. back, well, which didn't work, unfortunately. Well, um, we have seen China uh, using its economic influence on politics, like uh, China stopped the export of rare earth to Japan. It stopped importing uh, Norwegian salmon or fruits from Taiwan and the uh, Philippines. So China is becoming a risk in the global supply chain. And uh, now CC CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, is trying to apply new rules to the Chinese company, uh, which reflect uh, Communist Party value. So the Chinese corporations are not are able to act as an independent uh, entity in the global supply chain. It is uh, always under the influence of the Chinese Communist Party. So that increased uh, uh, more risk in supply chain in globally. So we have to be very careful how to uh, manage this risk. So the Prime Minister Kishida is setting up a new uh, ministry uh, to watch over the economic security. But at the same time, there are bigger uh, security 
rising in uh, trade or well, disruption in logistics is one. Uh, the fear of U.S. inflation and uh, interest rate hike uh, probably on the horizon. Um, so there are something we need to watch over. Also, uh, we've been talking about the risk involving China, but uh, many Japanese corporations are thinking about uh, risk of extraterritorial application of the United States laws or sanctions. Hmm. So the Japanese <clears throat> company need to be very careful how right. to deal with the United States, how to deal with China, how to deal with you know other country that U.S. sanctions being applied to. So there are a lot of legal costs to not to infringe on the U.S. laws that applied extraterritorially. So that is another issue. We also uh, see human rights is playing role in the trade, uh, like a cotton coming from China with yeah. uh, forced labor. Or what about uh, greenhouse gas emissions? Uh, if we are uh, seriously try to uh, get 1.5 degree, then those countries who are not really trying should we import uh, goods and services from those countries? That going to be another major issue. So there are a lot of things that each company need to watch over, and right. it has increased legal cost for sure. those companies. So as each government, what should we do? Should we pay more attention to economic security, or should we try to iron out a disruption in logistics right now? Uh, there a uh, lack of supply in semiconductor uh, that slowed down uh, Japanese automobile manufacturers. So we are investing in bringing in TSMC uh, manufacturing plant to Japan, sure. right. and the uh, government is give, going to give subsidies to right. uh, TSMC. We're so there are a lot of things on the horizon, and we cannot tackle everything. So we need to put the priorities on mm -hmm. those for short-term basis and long-term. Short term, I think we need to look at the uh, uh, logistics issue mm -hmm. and uh, U.S. inflation. But in the long run, how are we going to deal with China risk is mm -hmm. probably the largest one. And mm -hmm. uh, we definitely need to increase the communication with Chinese government or Chinese Communist Party. Uh -huh. And uh, we need to uh, maintain the communication with each Chinese corporation, how they think they are going to be affected. Right. And if there's a way to divest from China to other Southeast Asian countries. Yep. So uh, it's going to be a very interesting age to come. Thank you, uh, kono uh, uh, I, I thought that was a very even-handed uh, treatment of the United States and China. Um, and I remember uh, your uh, conversation with Wang Yi in Manila in 2017. Uh, when you said certain big countries have responsibilities and they should behave like uh, <laughs> they own those responsibilities. Uh, those words are memorable. Um, I'm going to turn to uh, 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 Preeti Sinha of the uh, United Nations. Uh, I say that, uh, you know, you come with a, with a bit of a helicopter vision because you're not a participant in the politics of this place and you really have an investment and development uh, agenda. And maybe you might uh, want to tell us, uh, you know, the broad issues of the day. Uh, we were just chatting that Bangladesh has migrated from the LDC status, but there are 45 other LDCs in, around the world, including many in Asia, that are struggling with globalization. And what are the best ways we can help them become a partner in the global flows of uh, capital uh, and skills and uh, everything else? Yes. Well, thank, you. thank you so much, Ravi, for that uh, introduction. Thanks to Horasis. And on this panel of Asian Regeneration of Globalization, I'm coming to you from the UN Capital Development Fund. As you said, we have the mandate for capital and development. So in our early stage regional analysis of the ASEAN region, we find a great degree of uh, variety uh, in terms of obviously the recovery from COVID, the impact and the recovery, and a large part uh, linked to the integration of the global value chains and how countries have uh, 
dealt with it, have prepared in many ways, and uh, how they are positioned currently. Uh, certainly, sectors like manufacturing, um, you know, the integration of the value chain versus tourism, and all those impacts into these countries. So let me uh, express some of the views that we have. We are talking about a circular investment model for an equitable recovery. And in that context, let me say that at UNCDF, we focus on the digital um, transformation of countries. We focus on uh, municipal subnational uh, infrastructure investment, including green uh, and climate related infrastructure, and on investment um, opportunities in SMEs. So today we are quite bullish on the ASEAN member states to bounce back through the introduction of new technologies and solutions that will help them build back better. So we believe in the talents and the uh, staying power. And of course, we also uh, were recently at COP26, so we can bring some views from Glasgow as well. So we felt that the FDI should return and the positive performance of the intra-ASEAN investments as a new opportunity to develop enhanced cooperation within the region. So the circular investment model is about investment within the region and with such strong players as some of them uh, profiled here on the panel, uh, I'm sure that it is a very viable uh, economic uh, zone. Uh, therefore, we believe that investment value uh, should uh, be able to sustain and be stable uh, with less exposure to international currency uh, volatilities, um, less uh, uh, ex uh, you know, in, uh, exposure to inflation, commodity price rise, and uh, you know, there was mention about the containers as well. So we believe in these uh, models which um, increase financial flows by offering uh, equitable resilient financing within the region. And that obviously helps create the uh, achievement of the SDG goals. Um, while we, we hope that the investments uh, build up, we now also feel it's an opportunity to look at the ESG framework while these investments happen. So when you build back better, you build back, uh, build, you know, you build back with the ESG framework. So this intra-ASEAN investment, uh, we believe, will help, uh, will show the increased uh, use of transboundary financial products, fintech solutions that can usher in new financing systems, including a digital currency, perhaps uh, a new trend. And I know, again, some of these major centers represented here might have a view. Um, one example uh, of a digital currency is the Bakong that has uh, benefited over 6 million people and is used by over 200,000 um, uh, registered users. So we are actively supporting the governments in the region and the performance of the financial systems through capital markets recovery, technical assistance, uh, legal um, helping with legislative reform and the that ESG SDG plans. Uh, just uh, two days ago, I uh, inaugurated the Smart Green ASEAN Cities program. It is mm. implemented by UNCDF, <coughs> the European Union. It's a sure. program that will support ASEAN uh, states so at a city, national and regional level to deal with urban, environmental, climate related governance issues, focusing on smart uh, solutions. So we continue this uh, this work. And let me say just in interest of time, I know you'd like to have some really interesting questions. So as the as a hybrid development agency and development finance agency, UNCDF remains committed to the region. And I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for, uh, for those remarks and for being so uh, uh, so 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 uh, uh, putting things across uh, in such a brief but uh, concise manner. I want to raise an issue that uh, featured in uh, three of your four press. I mean, uh, uh, of your uh, presentations, and that is the digital uh, part. You know. Um, if you look at ASEAN, China, India, we are sprouting digital unicorns by the day, and they are often supported with Japanese capital. Yet, uh, uh, we don't see enough discussion on digital exchange. Uh, and one criticism of RCEP is that it doesn't do enough for digital trade. So I'd like to ask, uh, you know, uh, 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 in fact, Joseph, you can also come in on this. Uh, uh, Pakamil and, uh, you know, uh, uh, Minister Kono, is enough being done on this? And, uh, and a related issue is, do we have enough pathways towards enforcing digital justice? Because, it's, you know, the, the, the legal part of uh, the digital exchange is going to be a big issue coming up as, with trust on one side and the legal part on the other side. Is it time that uh, this region started to talk about these issues? And could the UN be a possible forum for that? Um, I suggest, uh, 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 Kunusan, you might want to start on this. Thank you. 
Well, uh, we propose the DFFT uh, data free flow with trust at the uh, Osaka G20 summit. Right. And uh, definitely, we need to come up with something uh, different from U.S. model where the big company kind of monopolize data or Chinese model where the mm -hmm. government has all the access to personal data. Mm -hmm. Well, the European model is good, but uh, it put a lot of uh, effort on the company to use it. So mm -hmm. we need a new uh, framework to use uh, da you know, big data uh, for the future, future use. And uh, we definitely need to uh, promote the DFFT uh, discussion uh, for digital transformation. Um, Japan, well, the COVID-19 made it obvious that Japan is really lagging behind in uh, digital transformation. We still use tons of paper, I mean, paperwork. We are trying to cut the quarantine period to three days, but in order to get it, uh, the company has to submit a huge amount of paper, and that's killing the bureaucrats as well. So Japan is uh, what well, we need to catch up digital transformation uh, fastest way. Uh, we should have a uh, technology, but uh, we are not uh, utilizing it. So in Asia, well, technology may be there, but the legal framework and uh, I think the bureaucratic mindset to move out of paper to digital, uh, that is required. And some company like Singapore are really going ahead and mm -hmm. a country like Japan is like lagging behind. Sure. So there's a lot of gap in Asia. And uh, I think we need to help out each other with technology and create a legal framework applied can, to... Can the UN be a good forum to discuss this, uh, uh, Preeti? Do you think uh, oh. it could be the appropriate forum? Well, certainly, because for us, it's a development issue. So let me right. say, perhaps from our perspective, we support the CBDC. That's the Central Bank Digital Currencies, obviously officiated and regulated. And so the example I was saying of Bakong, you know, it's Cambodia that's issued this, and Cambodia is still an LDC, so remarkable achievement. And what it impacts, for example, is remittances. You see, there is around $702 billion in remittances going across borders. So using this Bakong system um, allows us to bring down cost of transmission, and right now, I think it's going from Malaysian ringgits to USD to Cambodia. So the idea is it should go from Malaysian ringgits to Cambodian currency. So local currency um, movements as well is something that could be encouraged. So on these themes, yes, the UN would certainly be a great... Uh, Wonderful. Thank you. Joseph, could you, I mean, since you are a corner of China and increasingly uh, uh, enmeshed with China and you're the only so-called Chinese presence here, can you address this matter of trust? in the digital trade and how important it is to have that bridging trust that can bring China fully into the Asian flows. Sure, thank you. Well, I think in terms of the development of uh, digital economy and fintech, I'll try to comment on different ways. First, I would like to share <coughs> with you from China's, um, well, the mainland market perspective, right? They have already started uh, to use uh, ECNY, electronic mm -hmm. um, Roman B basically. And at the moment, from Hong Kong perspective, uh, we are working with PBOC, uh, the central bank of, uh, of mainland China, uh, right. to, to test the possibility of uh, have a cross-boundary uh, usage of uh, ECNY. So um, definitely in terms of using um, central bank digital currencies uh, locally and for cross-boundary trade, that's what we are looking into. Um, the other thing is um, in Hong Kong, we have developed a... Um, a e trade connect, which is basically a uh, trade finance uh, a platform supported by blockchain. Uh, it was developed by a consortium of banks locally. And we're also working with um, the mainland authorities about how to link our uh, trade finance platform locally here with their similar uh, uh, platform uh, from mainland as well. So uh, as, as always, right, Hong Kong is the international financial center of China. And Hong Kong, we offer free flow of capital, free flow of information, with common law. And in fact, right, we rank number one in terms of economic freedom by the uh, report by uh, Canadian-based uh, Fraser Institute. So I think uh, people can make use of Hong Kong's platform to work uh, in terms of penetrate into the mainland markets on that. Uh, since we touch on um, 
the uh, digitalization of the economy. I also would like to share with you that, in fact, in Hong Kong, at the moment, over 90% of our payment are electronic payments in the form of e-wallet or credit cards or octopus card, which is locally uh, developed devices a couple of decades ago. And in terms of the fintech adoption index globally, uh, we actually uh, rank higher than uh, many major economies, including the U.S., Japan, France, or Germany. Uh, at the moment in Hong Kong, we have eight virtual banks, uh, four virtual insurers. All these are actually uh, licensed, granted by our regulators. So I think that goes back to earlier discussion that we do believe as we move forward with um, uh, fintech as well, a certain regulation, certain regulatory regime have to be put in place. Um, next year, we are planning to um, implement a... Uh, actually, next year, we, we're going to propose to our legislative council a regulatory regime for virtual asset service providers as well. Uh, so that on one hand, we keep the virtual assets and business going. At the same time, it will be operating on a more regulated manner. So uh, definitely, uh, we will promote um, fintech, we will promote financial inclusion through techno technological innovations, but and also we'll promote cross-boundary usage of um, fintech in terms of CBDC, in terms of trade finance. But at the same time, we need to keep um, upping our game in terms right. of our regulatory framework <clears throat> to catch up with technological advancements. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Joseph. Uh, Pak Emil, this question is uh, uh, directed to you. Uh, you heard uh, Konosan talking about uh, TSMC uh, setting up uh, semiconductor production in Japan uh, with uh, help of the Japanese state, which really is onshoring, if you call it. You know, it it's it's a, it's a reverse of globalization in a way because. You would, it doesn't matter where chips are most efficiently produced, but for the needs of the day, you need to have them produced at home on shore. So it is a corollary of the technology decoupling that is being forced upon uh, us. And if you, uh, you know, I mean, you know very well that companies today in Asia are, are having an Ali cloud and uh, a Microsoft cloud. Uh, you know, they, it's a lot of expense for them to to somehow steer in the middle. Indonesia is the biggest country in ASEAN, the biggest economy. Uh, today, you're in a situation where you, you, you have more Chinese uh, expatriates living in Indonesia than Japanese. It came as a surprise to me to hear that, uh, uh, to learn of that statistic uh, a few days ago. How do you navigate uh, these cross currents of, uh, uh, you know, forced decoupling that's happening in technology and all that. How does a big country like Indonesia, which has so much at stake, how do you, how do you go through this and yet stay open to the world? Yeah, very interesting. I think the phenomenon of onshoring between uh, developed countries are doing that, uh, bringing job back to their uh, home countries. Uh, there's also a phenomenon of, I, I mean, Japanese and other investment diversifying their portfolio from China to other countries. COVID-19 is really interesting because it shows that uh, uh, at the end of the day, I think uh, you want to have more control of what is happening. Uh, it may be uh, actually uh, transgressed from what we thought is a force of globalization. But uh, now now East Java, uh, as one of the most advanced economy in Indonesia, local economy, uh, our value proposition is different than it was a few uh, many decades back when we were bringing in many foreign investors on the basis of really natural resources, cheap labor. Now, I think the value we have is an affluent and very promising market. Uh, as we know, uh, our digital market in Indonesia itself is nearly touching 25 billion US dollar uh, this year. Uh, so it's a very affluent market and uh, many uh, global players go into East Java on the basis of the adequate infrastructure uh, on the much improved uh, human resource uh, and also the compelling uh, market size. I mean, I think out of the 600 million something ASEAN, we're nearly half of that. So it's really, it's really uh, that value proposition that we're trying to to bring uh, to the table. And uh, realizing that East Java is really uh, focusing on a number. We have uh, uh, in around Surabaya, 50% of our economy happens in the municipalities 
Surabaya and its adjacent muni- municipalities. Uh, so that area has a more competitive, higher labor uh, wage, but much better infrastructure and uh, billion dollars of investments are there. And we just uh, officiated a special economic zone that uh, provide uh, mass fiscal incentives. Uh, 10-year tax holiday, 10-year import duty holiday, 10-year income tax holiday uh, in that area. But if you go with the highway that has recently been uh, built, uh, in less than an hour, you would go to a municipality that is very, very accessible from the major uh, export seaport with a labor wage that is just less than half. And that's why one of the major manufacturers of soccer balls uh, for the World Cup, Adida, uh, uh, their major supplier, uh, so move from Surabaya to an area called Madiun uh, because it's more competitive in terms of labor. So we have all of that. In one province, we have uh, uh, an area that relies on uh, infrastructure, advanced uh, human resource, access to uh, global market. Uh, but also we have an area that relies on uh, um, uh, much improved infrastructure and competitive uh, minimum labor wage. So uh, I, I, I don't think we're uh, bearish. We're still very bullish about the prospect of globalization even after COVID-19. That's a very heartening uh, note coming from uh, uh, Southeast Asia's largest economy and largest nation and so diverse and so many conflicting interests. I want to close the session uh, 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 with a question on a part of globalization that we don't discuss enough, which is the free movement of uh, talent and uh, tourists, uh, which is a key part of globalization, if you ask me. If you go to Japan today, uh, there are 3 million foreigners living in Japan. And who would imagine that uh, uh, 254,000 of them are Muslims uh, uh, in this, uh, you know, uh, monocultural kind of, uh, a nation and even demanding their own burial yards and all that. Joseph, I want to ask you this question because you are, you epitomize uh, what was globalization. You went to the University of Michigan uh, yourself and... Um, uh, today, you know, uh, Chinese students everywhere are looked upon with a bit of suspicion in uh, certain countries in the West and uh, maybe even in Australia. Um, and you yourself have been losing talent. Uh, people have been leaving Hong Kong for whatever reason. Uh, could you give us a sense of how important it is to stay open to talent in this world? And after that, uh, Preeti, you might just close off uh, when uh, Joseph finishes and we'll wrap this up. Thank you. Well, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a very important part of our economy that we have the right talents, right? In fact, well, Hong Kong is the uh, leading international financial center in Asia, right? We rank number three in the world and number one in Asia by the Global Financial Center Index just published in September this year. But to make um, finance sector works, we need international talents as well. So that's always, as you mentioned, in my um, in in my in my own career path, in my college career path in the in the finance industry, we always have expats from everywhere. Well, the good thing is uh, Hong Kong offers great opportunities, right? If you look at equities, we rank number one in Asia in terms of IPO fundraise last year. If you look at bond market, we rank number one in Asia for arranging uh, Asian international bonds. Insurance, we're also number one in insurance density. As an wealth management business, we rank number one in Asia. And actually, globally, we are number two in the world as well. So, well, if you look at all these figures, that means opportunities. And we have seen that still uh, people are very willing to come to Hong Kong because they know the opportunities are here. Uh, however, under uh, the pandemic, we admit that in terms of our quarantine requirement has uh, made the cost of moving here higher, right? Because when you come over, especially from high-risk country, and one has to go through the 21 days of quarantine requirement. But um, as far as the public health is concerned, uh, as also you find that our local economy has completely bounced back, right? Talk about um, 7% GDP growth for the first three quarters. So we need to strike the right balance. And uh, But one, one step forward is that what we're targeting at is we want to have the quarantine free travel with mainland China. Because a big part of why talents come to Hong Kong is to use Hong Kong as a springboard for them, themselves or for the companies to penetrate into the mainland China market. So once we get the quarantine free travel with China um, open, then it will con- uh, it will even make Hong Kong a more attractive place uh, for, uh, for for foreigners and expats to come work here. Thank you. So, Thank yeah. you. Uh, Peter, you want to round that off? Uh, do you have anything to say about the importance of... Uh, talent flows for uh, keeping globalization going uh, against the kind of nativism we are seeing in some places? 
I'll just say uh, more on behalf of ILO, IMO, IOM, migration labor um, uh, organizations that the UN hosts that you know, free, free movement of talent is obviously always important, largely because new business models come out by people crossing borders. So right now it's uh, almost a theme, businesses that survive and thrive in COVID, right? There we see emergence of new ideas, new businesses. So I would really encourage, particularly as SMEs is where we think uh, the growth lies uh, in terms of livelihoods that we keep this uh, channel open on free flow of talent. I think that's a, a brilliant note to end this uh, morning plenary. I want to thank all my uh, distinguished participants for their views. I want to thank uh, Horasis and Frank for putting together this uh, rather disparate uh, panel. Uh, you know, it, it brings uh, so many different viewpoints from so many different angles. And personally, for me, it's been an intensely rewarding experience. I want to thank all of you once again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ravi. Moderating. Thank you. Thank you. We could have gone much longer. Great discussion. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Buck, uh, Emil, are you there? Are you there, Buck? Yes, yes, I'm still here. Uh, okay. Good to, to catch up with you. Uh, I hope we can continue catching up after this. Uh, you give me your mobile number and I'll WhatsApp you and then we'll Oh, that be... would be great. Yeah. That would be great. Uh, 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 can I just read it out for you? Yes, please. Yes. It's 62-821-4195. Six two. Six two. Eight two one. Eight two one. 4195 4195 3300. 3300. Perfect. Yes. And I'll, I'll, I'll just WhatsApp you and then we can be in touch. Thank you, Mr. Ravi. One of these days, I'd love to come and see you in your Surabaya and your... Uh, uh, I, I, I'm looking forward and I'll, I'll definitely yeah. uh, welcome you and take you around the g g great places here. That'll be wonderful. I'd love, uh, I, Maybe I'll plan a visit sometime in January if that's convenient. In January, okay. So or if after, you, the, after the rains. Or, okay. <laughs> so uh, if you text me, then uh, we can we can continue to be in touch through WhatsApp. So, wonderful. Thank you very so great, much. Great moderating, Parafi, uh, Mr. Oh, Ravi. Thank you. Thanks. God bless you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.